Hello, good afternoon. This is Joy News Today with me, Carlos Caloni. Our headline, Global Fund explains why it refused to pay for clearance of lock-up essentials at the port as Parliament Health Committee had voice to call for government to clear items at the port. There is the need for us as Parliament to make sure that we liaise with the presidency for them to ensure that we clear this good. Also, public account committee sitting ends abruptly after road ministry fails to provide essential documents. We can only consider this report if those documents are available. An electoral commission meets stakeholders to plan for the December polls. There's business, sport, and showbiz in this package. Do stay for details. Thank you so much for choosing us. Now, 266 containers fully loaded with antiretroviral drugs, insecticide treatment, rapid diagnostic tests, that is RDT, cartridges and others remain exposed to the weather at the thermal port for over a year, as government expects donors to cover the $3.6 million clearance cost. Civil society organizations in HIV, TB, and malaria say the delay in clearing the much needed health commodities is adversely affecting healthcare delivery in the country. Uh, we'll speak to the executive director for, Hope, uh, for future generations shortly, but uh, let's move on to uh, what uh, Parliament has been saying about this particular issue, where Parliament Health Committee is asking government to, as a matter of agency, release funds to clear locked up uh, health essentials at the port. Hotoji Alexander Roosevelt is MP for Central Tongu and a member of the Health Committee in Parliament. He spoke earlier on news desk. So I think there is the need for us to protect the image of this country. There is the need for us as Parliament to make sure that we liaise with the presidency through our chairman and all the revenue collection agencies for them to ensure that we clear this good so that we we'll remain in the good books of global fund. Other than that, Ghana's image will be dragged into the mud. But I, that, that's notwithstanding, let me say here that the 40 million that we are talking about, the 40 million dollars that we are talking about that is just for logistics. There are other things that we benefit from the global fund. Because in total, we always get not less than $100 million from global fund. So if we are joking with the logistics now, the situation will be that we'll be losing that. And Ghana is not better positioned to take its own destiny into its own hands. That is my fear. The relationship with Global Fund now will be something else. What I know is that because the procurement was made by the Global Fund itself, people are not happy with it. And I believe that is the cause of this food dragging situation in the country. But we must live beyond our personal interest. We must live beyond our parochial interest and take the country's interest to heart. I, I, I strongly believe because we experienced this thing with the GAFI and this one with Global Fund, this is in itself a vote of no confidence in the current leadership. Because to restore the relationship with Global Fund now, there should be a new leadership altogether. There should be a new leadership altogether. Now, joining us on this issue is Cecilia Lodono. She is the Executive Director for Hope for Future Generations and also a board member of the Global Fund. We are grateful for your time, 
uh, madam. Uh, share with us uh, when this decision was taken and why. Thank you. Yeah, so I was asking, uh, share with us uh, at what point was this decision taken and what's the key reason behind this particular decision to suspend supplies to Ghana? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and good afternoon to your listeners. I would like to say that um, Global Fund will never suspend uh, commodities to Ghana because the persons affected by TB, HIV, and malaria are at the center of the Global Fund uh, program implementation. And this decision to suspend might not be suspend, but it's likely that because we, the country is unable to uh, clear very large quantity of commodities, the containers are still packed at the port, the space to bring new commodities is not possible because they will have to deliver more. Mm. And so what is happening now is that Global Fund is just waiting to see if this will be cleared so that they can have enough space to send more because these are drugs, life-saving drugs for persons who are infected by HIV and TB and malaria. And so that is what they are working around. So as soon as it's cleared and there is space, I think there will be, the, they will continue sending more because it's the country that requests for quantity of commodities based mm. on our disease burden. Mm. And so it's a country that is asking Global Fund for this. And our responsibility is to ensure that we kill that we clear it from the force. All right. So uh, because yesterday the CSOs told the media that there's some suspension of some of the uh, medical supplies that were supposed to come to this country. But going forward, what is the fund's position even if this consignment is, is, is cleared? I mean, or, or maybe it's not cleared. What is your position? Well, you know, the way Global Fund works, it's government-to-government -government partnership, but for Global Fund, communities and civil society are very important because of accountability issues. And so what will happen is that the country has to sit down and see how they can grant a kind of immunity to Global Fund. And so whatever is blocking this, the country has to agree. And I know these are diplomatic uh, system and structures that every country working with Global Fund is supposed to adhere to. Unfortunately, as a country, we are not able to do that. I know there has been a lot of discussion and advocacy at different levels and a lot of promises. And so what I would suggest as a Ghanaian, as a civil society person and an advocate for the three diseases is that we should immediately put systems in place. I think what is good is that we have a, a, a partner that is willing to support the country. Just imagine all this number of persons living with HIV. If we don't get them this drug, and it's life-saving drugs, you know? So that would mean that they'll die. And I wonder if the country has that money. Global Fund doesn't only procure. They also support our health systems. And it was all this investment that has made the country stronger and we're able to fight diseases and we continue to fight diseases. And so I think we should prioritize partners who work with us and also plan to own our own health, our own health instead of depending on donors. And that is why we are calling for more domestic resources mm. to ensure that we own health and make sure that we invest money in health, build stronger health systems so that when you are sick, you don't need to travel to any country. Mm. If African countries are doing it, why can't we do it as a country? We yeah. should all have a stronger health system, address the gaps and governance structures that we have gaps in, and make sure that we call spade a spade mm. and move forward as a country. It's embarrassing at times when you are at the global level, and they are talking about Ghana, you know? All right. Thank you so much, Madam Cecilia Lodono, for sharing those uh, details with us, we'll still keep our eyes on this particular story. But away from the story, sitting by the Public Account Committee to scrutinize Cocoa Road contract, as well as performance audit of the Ministry of Road and Highways, has ended abruptly after the road ministry failed to supply some documents. The minority in the last few months have been alleging corruption in the awarding of Cocoa Road contract and have been demanding from Cocoa Board a fully audited report on Cocoa Road's contract 
Now, the Roads and Highways Ministry were also expected to answer questions on the sector. However, Chairman of the Public Account Committee, Dr. James Kluche Abeji, says the hearing cannot proceed without the submission of some crucial document. Based on these reports, I requested for some documentation from the Ghana Highway Authority. My information is that those documents are not available at the moment, and that you are working on them to provide those documents. And so we can only consider this report if those documents are available. When do you think you can make those documents available? Because you have explained to me the reasons why you were not able to make them available as requested. When do you think you can make them available so that we can schedule a new date for you? Now, let's get further details from Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent Kweko Asante. Uh, Kweko, what documents are these uh, the chairman uh, has been talking about? But we know that over the last few months, the minority have been raising concerns about audited COCO reports and have been demanding those reports. And so the COCO board has been assuring that they were going to give that. We do not know yet if those documents are the ones in question, but there are also concerns about the road industry and selling contracts they handed out and the Public Accounts Committee demanding that they need those documents to be able to move forward. And so once they get that, then mm. they can ask the relevant questions. And if they don't get that, they, they can't do any more. But the committee themselves, a little startled about what specifically they are demanding and saying that until these documents are presented, they are not going to, they are not going to, they are not going to give any hearing to these two institutions. All right, so will the committee continue sitting and how soon do they expect the ministry to provide these documents? Well, the committee has again sitting for, for, for now because we were able to do this. They've been meeting mainly to interrogate the Bank of Ghana governor and this issue. They've been able to defend some of the matters regarding the Bank of Ghana governor. But these outstanding matters have not been able, they have not been able to deal with them. And so they are taking an agenda. Mm. They're expecting that in the next few weeks they'll be able to get some assurances and then they can come back and consider this. We are grateful. Kweko Santi is our parliamentary affairs correspondent. Uh, but let's uh, stay in parliament a bit longer because... I mean, Parliament's core function is to make laws for the country and represent the interests of their constituents. But that are expanded into other areas, such as attending funerals, paying medical bills and school fees, and many others. While well, some members of Parliament say this additional workload is taking a toll on them financially and health-wise, uh, with some saying that the job is becoming increasingly uh, stressful. Zule Hanuhu has more in the following report. And Mr. Speaker, at the time, Professor Michael Quay, as chair of the board, needed to help a former MP with 12,000 Ghana cities. And this MP was requesting to do a surgery, prostate, a prostate surgery. I want to keep the name because... It's a typical day in Parliament, where members of Parliament passionately debate matters concerning their constituents. However, today's focus shifts inward as concerns about the health of MPs take center stage. Tamale South MP and former minority leader Haruna Idrisu had raised concerns on the floor of the House about the quality of health of former members of parliament and incumbent members of parliament. Outside the parliamentary chamber, MPs reflect on the toll their work takes on their well-being. In Shiaesu MP, Stephen Amwa means no words as he said, the work is stressful. Honestly speaking, I think the, the word stress is even an understatement. It's extremely stressful, extremely, very, very stressful. And it's stressful because of what it entails. The work is extremely cumbersome because you need to work here. You need to attend to your constituents and then even <laughs> Ghana at large. And now they are shifting almost everything about the country to MP. So I think even it moves beyond the core functions of a parliamentarian. If somebody has any issue, being social, being developmental, being economical, being financial, they call the MP. So it's getting too tedious. 
Busiga MP, Ladi Ayamba, highlighted that the health and financial stability of MPs are significantly impacted by their responsibilities. Very, very, very stressful. Very stressful. We have personal issues. We have community issues. We have religious issues. We have constituency at large issues. You have people who come to you about ill health. And they come to you with all sincerity that you have to help them. You have nowhere to turn to. Nobody to give you. The unfortunate thing and the painful aspect is that people rather tend to always be talking about common fund, MPs common fund, MPs common fund. This thing is supposed to be to come quarterly. So people come about health. People come about education. That is school fees. Others come about even marriage. Person wants to marry and comes to you as an MP that you should help or, or support that person, him or her, to marry. Both men and women, or boys and girls, they do. Bolibam boy MP Yusuf Sulemana echoed the same sentiments, indicating that the overwhelming responsibilities of MPs have a profound effect on their health. Let me admit that indeed my work is very stressful. You have three major uh, constituencies to look at. One, you want to serve the interests of your constituency. In that regard, whether the person is MPP, the person is NDC, that's not the issue. Your concern is... <laughs>
in May, uh, on May 7, 2024. So these are some of the issues and other issues arising that will be discussed before the Interparty uh, Advisory uh, Committee that is currently uh, ongoing. All right, that was my colleague uh, Mbura uh, from the Electoral Commission. Now let's take you to the Ashanti region where a Muslim organization based in Kumasi is asking President Akufuado to ascend to the anti-LGBTQ bill. The group known as Muslims Executive Foundation, MEF, characterized the bill as having undergone extensive consultations prior to its passage, making a significant milestone in Ghana's legislative history. The Muslim Executive Foundation says their street demonstration will receive support from the Christian community as the Bible condemns homosexuality. Here is the chairman of the group, Al Haji Musa Abubakar. <laughs> When disaster looms, no one will escape its impact. Therefore, we refuse to wait for it to strike. Currently, we are waiting, perhaps, for the president to sign the bill into law. However, if it remains unsigned after Ramadan, we plan to organize a street demonstration to express our dissatisfaction and exert pressure on the president to sign it. We expect that the Christian community will also participate in the demonstration. The group says they reject pressure and attempts by some foreign elements in the country to prevent the passage of the bail. Secretary Mohamed Amin is urging President Nana Adunamkwa Kufuado to sign the bail into law. Indeed, it's an alien to our culture and threat to their human existence. So we reject all pressure and attempts by some foreign elements in the country to prevent the passage of the bill and hold firm to our resolve as a country to the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda, through which we can progress as a nation. It is in the light of this resolve that we call on the President, His Excellency Nana Adudankwa Akuf Adu, to sign the bill into war, to conclude the efforts of the Parliament of Ghana, this is a great legacy that our president can leave behind for prosperity. A report by Mohamed Nuruddin. Now, the Dean of the School of Geosciences at the University of Energy and Natural Resources, Professor Emmanuel Ahin, is advocating for a partnership between geoscientists and healthcare practitioners to safeguard the health and well-being of communities. Uh, speaking at the World Geoscientists and Geologists Day at Doma in the Bono region, Professor Ahin said such interdisciplinary collaboration holds the potential to revolutionize preventive healthcare in Ghana by taking advantage of the knowledge and research from geosciences. Precious Semevo has more. The celebration of World Geoscientists Day at the Doma campus of the University of Energy and Natural Resources was marked by an exhibition and a lecture on the theme, Geoscience, a key entity in addressing preventive health in Ghana. Various speakers expressed worry about the inability to embrace the knowledge and research of geoscientists, the study of the earth and its processes to mitigate environmental health and other concerns of the country. Chrysla Akwe Ankara is the president of the Ghana Institute of Geosciences. We went to school to study the F, uh, its compositions, and also how it's being formed, and the principles that governs its formation. By so doing, we know some of the intricate composition, be it the mineralogy, the minerals that are in it, and those minerals that can also have negative impact on our health, especially when they cross certain threshold, when we become overexposed, and then the medical science can then bring on board some of their knowledge in helping to deal with it or helping to mitigate.
the negative impact that it will uh, attempt to cause. Speaking on the topic, origins of emerging non-communicable diseases, the concealed perils to public health, the Dean of School of Geosciences, UNE, Professor Emmanuel Ahin, said a partnership between geoscientists and healthcare practitioners is the right way to attain better health care. What we are not doing right is that we are not involving all disciplines that have something to contribute as far as our health is concerned. That is why I am propagating this message that it's time, it's long overdue, there should be a partnership between geoscientists and what? the health practitioners. So this meeting that we're having here today is to talk about possible consortium which will be formed so that together we will address this problem. We know that the people who have degrees in public health don't know anything about geology. So we will let them have some top up here and then together with their public health knowledge we will address this problem. Former health minister and MP for Doma Centra, Kukwajiman Menu, envisaged the Ghanaian economy and beyond would also benefit from the research work of Ghanaian students. I believe that this is time for us to collaborate to see how we can utilize and make good use of research findings in our country. And I want to believe that one day we should also benefit from students' projects in Ghana, in the Ghanaian economy as well, so that we can also go out there and market what we have in our system. Precious Semevo, Joy News, Doma. Let's now take you to the Volta region where management of the Kwando Senior High School and the top hierarchy of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church have taken the initiative to curb immorality among students. Uh, the school has constructed a residential facility and established a counseling unit to ensure the moral and spiritual upbringing of the student during their stay on campus. Fred Kwame Asari has more in the following report. Senior high schools are gradually becoming breeding grounds for immorality. Substance abuse, alcoholism, sexualism and radicalism are a few of the immoral acts widely spreading among students. These acts play a significant role in jeopardizing the future of students who are unguarded and find themselves engaging in them. In an attempt to curb immorality, Authorities at the Kwando Senior High School, with support from the Evangelical Presbyterian Church Ghana, have intensified measures to ensure moral upbringing by establishing a dedicated chaplain unit. So, Kwando Senior High School has deemed it fit, uh, fit to have a very solid chaplaincy services for our students. Hence, the building of a pastor residence to accommodate the pastor who is in charge of chaplaincy activities on campus. I intend to continue with counseling for our students and also invite other resource persons living wayward life that may have serious implications on their lives in future. So the pastor residents has come at the right time for the chaplain of the school to be housed on campus so that he can be accessible to students whenever they need his services for counseling, for moral upbringing, and other spiritual needs of the school. The moderator of the EP Church, Right Reverend Lieutenant Colonel Bliss Divine Agbeko retired, lauded the initiative. And also we have dedicated and commissioned the Kwando Aziavi Congregational Chapel. It is important that this must be commended, that all schools, their chaplains, should be housed on campus so that they can support the administration in managing the life and activities of students and also provide pastoral counseling uh, psychological and emotional support to those who need it, the staff and the students and the auxiliary workers. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News. Me, Carlos Caloni. We'll take a short break. We'll return with business. Please stay. 
Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the business segment on Joy News today with me, Pius Kojo Baka. The Ghana city narrowed its year to date loss to the US dollar to about 7.50% on the retail market after making some gains against the US dollar and the other major foreign currencies last week. We've got more for you in this report. The inflows helped to ease the depreciated pressure on the local currency. These developments resulted in improved selling activity by the Bank of Ghana on the spot market, supporting the city against the major trading currencies. The local unit gained 0.56% week on week against the dollar, closing at a mid rate of 13 cities, 43 pesos. Similarly, the city gained 1.51% and 0.35% week on week against the pound and the euro on the retail market. The International Monetary Fund Mission Team arrived in Ghana to evaluate the progress made by Ghana regarding the fund support program. A successful review will pave the way for a third tranche disbursement of $360 million under the $3 billion extended credit facility. Analysts believe a successful review will boost market sentiments around the city and help curb speculative activities. The Asafo market in the Ashanti region is undergoing redevelopment to meet demands of a modern market. The reconstruction project, which will be delivered in six months, will ensure that the market is far resilient and equipped with modern safety and security equipment. There is more from Nanaya Ojima. The reconstruction was expected to start in January 2024, but was delayed due to relocation of traders at the market. At the time of our visit, most of the traders have vacated the shops as construction workers remove roofing of the old structure. The contractors are working hard to make sure that they, 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 they finish up the work as um, promising in the contract. And we're also going to make sure we monitor from day one to the end of the contract term. Um, fortunately for us, the consultants and the supervisors are from the engineering department of the assembly. And I'll personally make sure that, yes, the work goes on as we, we want it. In 2019, many shops were burnt after fire swept through the market, negatively impacting on traders. According to the fire service report, improving firefighting mechanisms would be necessary in preventing future incidents. Kumasi Mayor Sam Pine explained the market reconstruction will cater for these and other security issues. All the wooden structures within the place will be out. Um, entrances and exits for fire vehicles, tenders and the rest. Then we're also going to have a, a, a space for permanent staff of the National Fire Service to be there. Uh, as much as that we're also going to have a, a place for our um, electrical department of the assembly to be also housed in that facility. Again, we, 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 we got in some, we are almost getting a funding from an international partner to have a beautiful police post or police station built around the same area. Some traders have welcomed the decision to reconstruct the market. As you can see, they've already started work on the project. And we are sure that with regards to the time frame that we've so far given to us as in completing the project, we are very sure of completion so that we can come back and bounce back into business. For joining us, Nanaya Ochima reporting. And that's it for business. I am Pius Kojo Baka. Welcome to the sports segment on GN Today. My name is Haruna Mubarak. Now, Ghana's high jump gold medalist at African Games, Kadman Evans, says he started as a footballer, but when he was in secondary school, he transitioned into a high jump player. He has been speaking to Muftar Nabila Abdullahi. My story about high jump, like, I keep telling everyone who asks me the same question. I wasn't a high jumper at first. I was a football player. Mm -hmm. And a really good football player. I started with like FC Bata Kit in Mamprobi. I played really well. I had like so many scouts coming in, trying to sign me. My, my dad hasn't been a fan of like being in a football academy. So I went to Swedish Senior High School. I, I played on the basketball team, played on the soccer team. 
I tried volleyball, I tried handball. So it was like anything other than athletics. So I saw people high jump. And I think in my second year, I saw one of my seniors having a severe injury in the high jump. Uh, they were practicing, so they, like, he had a, a serious injury. And since then, it shaped my idea of high jump. I didn't, I never dreamt of being a high jumper because of that injury. However, my best friend, who uh, I gave you his number to interview, he was a high jumper for the school since uh, we went to SHS1. And I saw him high jump. As I said, I never wanted to be a high jumper. But on one faithful uh, afternoon after school, I was going to play soccer, and I saw them like high jumping for fun. And I was like, okay, fine. Since uh, the soccer team is not yet ready, let me just try one. And uh, I could go ahead and go uh, do my soccer training. And uh, the, uh, the funny thing is, I didn't use the approach they were using. I just headed over the bar and just walked away. Then uh, all of them came to me like, hey, did you just do that? That's the high school record that you just used your legs to clear. And I was like, I had no idea what I just did. Good afternoon, welcome to the show. This segment with me, Jacqueline and Sumaya Boa. Chief Executive Officer of the Chosen Rehab Center, Apostle Daniel Kobe Washington, has called out the lack of employment opportunities for people who have to overcome their addictions. According to him, the inability of society to give these individuals who have worked greatly on themselves to be better persons an opportunity can result in a relapse. He was on Joy FM Showbiz A to Z. The problem we are facing in Ghana is that there is not... Um, after the rehabilitation, what is next? That is, that is my problem. Uh, because those of us that you, you've traveled a little bit, you can see that when somebody leaves a rehab, they can easily get a job at McDonald's. They can get a job at Burger King. They can get a job at KFC. But do we do the same thing here? Or we stigmatize and we tell mm. them, this mm. person cannot be accepted. So the addict that is doing very, no, no more addict. addict. The, the the drug dependent person okay who who needs to have a, a new a new what do you call a it new a, life. a new life or new people around him maybe they work or no he has no job walks through Accra he drops CVs everywhere mm. and nobody mm. will accept him mm. and at the end of the day he said let me go to the people that accepts me and that could easily be the ghetto or okay. the drinking bar so he goes there to say chale chale to his old buddies. Mm. And then the buddies are like, hey, you're looking very good. Can we welcome you with just one sip? Is that one of the factors for relapse? That's, mm. that's it. So, so if the society <clears throat> is not ready to embrace the um, dependent, ex-dependent, or the rehab rehabilitant, mm -hmm. then he goes back because everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody wants to go to where they are easily embraced you feel love you don't feel jack on that note is a wrap for the show this segment with me jacqueline and suma yabwa and that's all we have in this hour you can log on to myjoyonline.com for more stories my name is carlos caloni thank you so much for watching have a great afternoon